Thank you very much. And thank you for coming to this session. Today, I will tell you how open data is used to monitor object procurement in Ukraine, which is my home country. And uh, I'm really grateful to the organizers of Open Belgium for inviting me and hosting the session. And I hope that um, Ukrainian experience will be useful uh, for Belgium and uh, that uh, you will learn something about uh, the usage of open data in public procurement that you can use here in Belgium. So, this number, 5 billion euros, this is the annual cost of corruption risk in public procurement in all EU countries together. And this problem remains a global issue. Public procurement is an area where corruption is very widespread in any country in the world. In Ukraine, this number is around $2 billion. And our uh, Ministry of Economy and Trade estimates it each year. It's kind of difficult uh, to get a very exact number. But um, in general, it's higher than in average EU country. And here, on this photo, you can see the bridge, which started, which uh, development started uh, 25 years ago, in 1993, and it's still unfinished. And uh, municipal budget is spending actually millions each year to support the bridge in this condition. And the citizens of Kyiv, they still cannot benefit from this piece of infrastructure. So. In uh, this sense, um, it's understandable that Ukrainians in general um, are very concerned about corruption and bribery in the government. They, they see this kind of uh, problems. And um, a recent uh, surveys show that actually um, our people are concerned more about um, cor corruption in, in the government than, for example, unemployment, or inflation. Only um, the situation in the eastern part of the country where we have uh, right now war uh, concerns people more. And this data is actually uh, uh, corroborated by um, Corruption Perception Index, which is an index run by Transparency International Secretariat. Last year we earned only 30 points which is a very low score for European region. For example, Belgium has 75 points. And this is uh, the gap which uh, cannot be closed like even in 10 year perspective. So with this situation in mind, on the way of uh, revolution back in 2014, uh, Ukrainian business and um, civil organizations started developing a new system for public procurement, electronic system where everything would be um, accessible to anyone. And uh, with the system with which um, the control over how public money is spent would be in the hands of business and civic society. So in March 2014, uh, this initiative has started. And at first, it was voluntary. But uh, then it was backed up by um, contributions from uh, Ukrainian business. So they didn't have uh, international donors at the, same, at, at the time. And basically, uh, nobody believed that it was uh, some kind of uh, initiative that would eventually turn into a country-level procurement system. In several months, the concept uh, of uh, the system was ready and the project team was consolidated. And already in February 2015, we had MVP, Minimum Viable Product of Prozoro. Prozoro means transparent in Ukrainian. So we decided to name the system accordingly to uh, the purpose it uh, should serve. And around this time, also the government and international donors they noticed the project and uh, they started um, investing, started um, uh, trying to um, kind of uh, conduct some kind of pilot study where, when via the system we would uh, procure 
uh, some certain amount of goods and see if it works or not. So in April 2015 happened like very important event because until this point the system was a kind of a civic initiative. And uh, in April um, this project team they came to the Ministry of Economy and Trade and this is uh, the ministry responsible for public procurement policy in Ukraine. So they created a state enterprise, Prozoro, and the uh, project team became um, public officials working for this state enterprise. This way, uh, the system was institutionalized. After that, they launched the pilot with Minister of Defense, uh, the first procurer, and um, these were exactly procurements for um, uh, this military conflict in the East and uh, the ministry was eager to try something new because um, they had a lot of problems uh, getting uh, these procurements on time. This pilot was successful and in December 2015 we had the new law passed in the parliament. It also uh, is a separate story how it became possible because uh, this law really changed um, the way public procurement is done in Ukraine. It integrated all these concepts of electronic system, its architecture, uh, open data into the law on public procurement. And um, actually uh, it happened just before New Year when uh, they were like, um, the main topic was uh, the budget for the next year. And uh, it became possible to pass this law while um, members of the parliament were occupied by uh, more important issues. And uh, after this law was passed, uh, in half a year, uh, the system became national. And right now, um, above certain threshold, all procurements uh, has, uh, have to be conducted only via preserve. So let's look at architecture of the system, because it's like uh, one of the main innovations uh, that we created. First of all, we have central database, uh, which is in the hands of the government. And there they publish uh, tender notices. This database uh, has public API, and uh, we have a number of electronic platforms, which used to be like five or six at the beginning. At the moment, it's around 20 <coughs> platforms who get these tender notices. So after the notice is published in central database, it's automatically copied to each platform. And they can keep their own databases, uh, which are like uh, the same with the governmental one. And basically, the role of these platforms is uh, very similar to what Amazon or eBay are doing. So they just um, advertise tender notices, work with clients, both with bidders and procurers, and receive a fee from each uh, successful purchase. We also have um, a separate um, kind of module for um, audit service uh, who monitors procurement. And they can access all the data via their own portal. And basically, um, as the system has public API, anyone can um, build their own kind of instrument to access this data. So key results for last year, which was the first complete year when Prozora was functioning, are the following. Uh, we had around uh, 900,000 uh, lots uh, procured. So this uh, number uh, um, does not include uh, the lots that were just published, but only the ones that were finished. And on uh, these procurements, we spent around 18 billion US dollars around uh, 125,000 participants came to these standards. And if we look at um, the statistics for only competitive procurements, uh, their participation is around uh, 2.3 offers per tender and average sa savings around 8%. So coming to open data, which is actually the topic of my talk, uh, all open data in Prozora is um, machine readable, compliant with international standard OCDS, and um, 
citizens can even follow auctions in real time. So we have like um, a specific role in the system when a person gets um, a link to the tender uh, if, it's, uh, if this person is not a participant and then can just watch how bidding process takes place. At the same time, uh, we have um, some things to improve in terms of open data. And in this um, case, I want to cite the study by DigiVist, which is a, a project um, that compares uh, open data on public procurement in U uh, European Union countries. And they published um, the ideal list of um, variables that should be disclosed in machine-readable format to public procurement. Uh, this list includes um, around uh, 39, 38, 39 variables, and basically, um, though Ukraine was not included in this study, we at TI Ukraine um, evaluated a preserve accordingly to um, this list of variables. And uh, the result was that only seven of them are not available or partially available in preserve. Uh, these variables are mostly related to contract performance. Uh, we have some of them, but we need to cover better this stage. And also to um, beneficial owners and subcontractors of uh, the bidders who participate in tendering processes. Also, <coughs> as the system has public API, uh, a lot of tools uh, can be built to analyze the data from the system. And I will present you just a couple of them. So first of all, we have business intelligence module. And this module uh, was given uh, to us uh, for free, and it's available online. So you can just uh, go to the link uh, bi.prozoro.org and uh, see all kinds of vis visual visualization of the statistics from the system. We also have a um, professional business intelligence module where you actually can create new objects it's not so nice, uh, it's not so kind of uh, graph and uh, picture oriented, but there uh, you can uh, choose like any sample from available variables and create your own study um, uh, depending on what you need. Uh, this module is not available uh, in free access, but we have a certain number of free licenses given to us by Click which is a company behind this uh, analytics. And we give these licenses to uh, professional journalists, uh, to state audit service, uh, who actually need to monitor procurement like on a professional basis. Also, we have um, monitoring portal Dozor. And what we discovered is that um, Prozoro uh, is a kind of uh, system which uh, <coughs> makes the data available. But also, we need a separate system to monitor how um, the tenders take, uh, take place. So in this portal, the Zorro, anyone can leave their comment on um, tenders and uh, basically discuss it with the public authorities. Uh, we have several of them participating on a voluntary basis. So they reply to comments via portal, and uh, we have a separate database for this portal where um, these problematic tenders, they have all the um, fields uh, which are available for normal tenders, but also fields on violations. And um, uh, this way, uh, it's a kind of, uh, we are trying to build this collaboration between government and civic organizations uh, working via this portal to discuss uh, what happened in these tenders. So it's also, uh, it, uh, the use of this portal by the government is not mandatory, but um, you can find there, for example, uh, templates of uh, letters that you can send to governmental authorities to convey, <coughs> and uh, basically by law they have to respond to this kind of letter. We are also creating regional networks of civic organizations who monitor public procurement. Because what we understood is that uh, from Kyiv, it's really difficult to uh, kind of comprehend the problem in specific tender which happens in specific region. There might be some connection 
um, between uh, the company who won this tender and some local oligarch, for example. And um, local civic organizations, they know better than we do what happened in this tender. So we educate um, in different regions such organizations and uh, try to um, uh, kind of raise uh, the level of uh, their um, professionalism. Again, key results from uh, civic monitoring. We have 44 risk indicators running uh, automatically on tenders uh, which start from one million uh, dollars. And, uh, oh, sorry, one million in uh, local currency. Uh, we um, have 24 civic society organizations working via the Zora portal, and they left around, um, uh, they uh, sent around 500, um, 5,000 appeals to controlling bodies, reacting to around uh, 10,000 complaints uh, left by tender participants. So it were like, um, uh, participants were like businesses who didn't manage to win the tender, and in their opinion, there was something uh, something wrong. So they left their complaint and basically got a reaction from civic organization monitoring this tender. And we also published two semi-annual monitoring reports where uh, we developed uh, a new methodology to monitor public procurements um, with the use of open data. And this methodology um, is a kind of integration of different approaches like from Hungary, from Armenia, from Paraguay, and these are like best practices of uh, monitoring public procurements around the world. So we tried to take into account uh, the data we have in Prozoro, because some data fields we also don't have, something we need to improve, and we applied the best practices to this data. And I would like to finish with uh, challenges that we face. So first of all, some data fields in the system are completed by hand. And this is just a catastrophe. Because uh, when uh, governmental officials get um, kind of a task to fill in a certain data field, everything might happen. And uh, for example, um, we have um, data on contracts under uh, threshold. Uh, completed uh, by officials who conducted a specific tender. And sometimes they just write like a phone number there instead of um, a sum of money. So uh, in big uh, data set, it's not possible to detect where was uh, this error and it's just not usable for analysis. Uh, then uh, we need to cover more um, post-tender stage. Actually, what happens after the contract was signed is this building um, kind of uh, complete and uh, working properly? Or is it like this bridge which I showed you like in the beginning? And then um, the analytical tools which uh, were created uh, from this public API, at the moment they are not integrated. So for example, for risk indicators you go to one website, for business intelligence model to another. And this is something that we also need to improve and to make it available in one place. So thank you very much for your attention. Mm -hmm.